You're listening to Now I've Heard Everything, interviews from the 80s, 90s, and 2000s with voices from the past. I became a better broadcaster. I became more confident to the point today where I don't think anyone could intimidate me. I couldn't get Mike fried no matter who I was interviewing. And Red Barber is the one I have to thank for that. Radio host Bob Edwards. Today on Now I've Heard Everything, I'm Bill Thompson. This Sunday is National Radio Day. It's the annual commemoration of all the contributions that the radio industry has made. So today I'll look back at an interview I did in 1993 about one radio legend. It was a book written by another very stalwart figure in American broadcasting. You see, for a dozen years, the retired, pioneering radio broadcaster Red Barber would call in to NPR's Morning Edition show every Friday for a four-minute unscripted talk with host Bob Edwards. Listeners love those segments, even listeners who seem to have little or no knowledge about baseball, because Red Barber didn't talk just about baseball. But Barber died in 1992. The next year, Edwards wrote a book, a memoir of his memorable conversations, a book he called Fridays with Red. And that's when I had a chance to meet him. So here now from 1993... Bob Edwards. I had no intention of ever writing a book. I always said that I cared too much for trees to um, add to the... Well, I get so many books in every day at NPR that, um, you know, there are a few worthy ones and the rest, you figure, why? And I didn't want to add to that. Um, But this was different. When I came back from Red's funeral, there were 500 letters on my desk, and it wasn't the volume, it was the quality of the letters. Um, People were grieving. People were trying to console me for the loss of what they detected a close friend over the years. Uh, They had listened to that friendship develop. But I think... in. In addition to trying to console me, they were working through their own grief. He affected people in a way that, oh, I think the rest of us in radio couldn't dream of touching. Uh, It was a a special sort of communication that I think is only possible on radio and only possible by a very small circle of people who have worked in the medium. Uh, It's it's terribly ironic. There wasn't at the outset of this, somebody sitting around a round table in a conference room saying, let's hire somebody that the public will fall in love with and we'll reach out to everybody. This was just one of the serendipitous things. Yeah, we had talked to him um, uh, about two things. First of all, about Jackie Robinson and just a piece about Black History Month. Uh, And then when Elston Howard died, Elston Howard was the first black to play for the New York Yankees, and we talked to him about Howard. Red had been at the microphone when Robinson broke into baseball and when Howard broke into um, the Yankee organization, Red had moved over to the Yankees. Um, And he was just so good. Uh, He was just warm, engaging, wonderful, witty. Um, And we thought, well, why not do this on a regular basis? And he said no at first because uh, he wanted all of his social security earnings and there is a cap on outside income until you're 72 years old. (laughs) But when he turned 72, he said, is the offer still good? And we said, of course. And he was an instant hit. People who uh, didn't like sports at all loved Red Barber. That seems to be one of the ironies. Here you have a baseball announcer that the nation, whether they are interested in baseball or not, some people who appear to have very little knowledge that, that he even had a connection with baseball at one That's time right. seem to get it, such a big, big kick out of him. That's right. Well, he broke through all the lines, and uh, it seemed like only occasionally we talked about baseball. I'm sure we did much more often than I recall, but he would talk about what was growing in his garden. He would talk about the weather in Tallahassee where he did his broadcast. He did them from his home. He would be talking to me. I'd be in a studio in Washington. He would be at his home in Tallahassee. Um, he would talk about the uh, squirrels getting into the bird seed he had left for the birds. He would talk about his cat um, who um, got too close to a mockingbird nest and was dive-bombed by Father Mockingbird. People love this stuff. This was... <laughs> <laughs> you wouldn't have predicted this, but uh, but people loved it. They loved the, this bit of humanity coming at them um, from Tallahassee every Friday. And, and uh, I don't know, they just felt 
engaged to a larger world out there. It was a welcome relief to all the mayhem and murder and war and pestilence and all the grim things we talk about in a news program. Here was Red. But it also struck me that had he been a perfectly competent baseball announcer who's retired from Florida, and you'd call him up every Friday and say, well, Mr. Barber, now the uh, Game 3 of the World Series coming up this Friday, and if he launched right into, well, yes, I think the pitching's going to have to be real strong, it would have lost something. It was, it was, it was his uh, talking about the gardening and the squirrels and all that really made it, wasn't it? Well, occasionally you could get him to talk about the <laughs> pitching and the hitting. <laughs> But usually he'd say, uh, well, Robert, that reminds me of the time in 1945 when Branch Rickey, yeah, those were his heroes, Branch Rickey and Larry McPhail, the two great innovators of baseball. Uh, so we, we'd, we'd get a history lesson. Uh, but there are very few people around who can give us that history lesson. So he had that dimension, too. Usually, if, if we wanted to talk about a um, contemporary sports event, he could find an example in his many years in the game uh, to show us that, well, this was nothing new after all. And uh, we've been around this block a couple of times before. I don't want to sound awkward, but I mean, we don't treat the elderly always with a quote, great deal of respect. Right. Did you ever fear at any point along the way that he's you know, 72 years old, he's, he's getting older. Did you ever worry, is Red going to go off the deep end some uh, morning? Or are we going to have some day when he's just going to just kind of lose touch with reality altogether? Not with Red. <laughs> uh, Red would show us time and again he was a lot sharper than we were. Uh, the body was very frail. He was a little scrawny guy. But the mind, the mind was working overtime. The wheels were turning all the time. For example, um, we talked once about the Iditarod sled dog race in Alaska. He was fascinated by that. Um, the, the, the elements, uh, the course, um, the, the teamwork between the team and the musher, and the fact that Susan Butcher won it four or five times. All of that fascinated him. One year they were having trouble with moose. There were so many moose in Alaska that year that the, the teams were running into moose. Not good for the teams. And I, playing the jocular host, I said, Well, Red, I guess you don't have much trouble with moose down there in Tallahassee. Ha, ha, ha. And he says, Only the fraternal kind. <laughs> now, see, that was so quick. Um, so whenever you, you were under some foolish notion that uh, here's a very old man I'm talking to and uh, maybe not all those synapses are there, he would zap you <laughs> and put you back in your place. And he was, he was a very punctual kind of guy. Very punctual, uh, very professional, very prepared, and he expected everyone who worked with him to be exactly the same way. And not all of the people who worked with him over the years appreciated that. Others did. His protege, Ben Scully, is the dean of uh, announcers today. Um, he became as good as he is today because he worked under Red Barber, who made him properly prepared and totally professional. Um, we would call Red at a given hour, and it would be not one minute before and not one minute less, or he'd let you know about it. Well, it's a great deal to be said for precision. I mean, a lot of people, when they retire, let's face it, they just you know forget the clocks, forget the watches. Uh, you know, I'll do do things on my own time as they as they come. But uh, you know, th th there is something to be said for that railroad precision. Well, and there's all too little of it today, anyway. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Particularly in our business, I think. Boy, that's for sure. Now, you addressed this in the book. You you said, I, I mean, almost poignantly, that there's scarcely seems to be any room anymore these days on commercial radio or even non-commercial radio for a Red Barber, an Edward R. Murrow. What has happened? Um, you cannot have another Red Barber because you wouldn't have time to be Red Barber. Red developed his personality... Um, in the course of long baseball games in which he had only three commercials. When he started out, that's, that was the business, three commercials in nine innings. Uh, today, uh, Bob Costas, or one of the other great sportscasters, has to do three commercials between pitches. <laughs> they're selling the beer, they're selling this, they're selling that. Um, there is no time to let your personality come across uh, on, in a radio broadcast. I think you can do it better in other areas, maybe an interview program or the like. But doing play-by-play, -play, it's all business, and you've got so much you've got to take care of, and the sponsors and the promos and the uh, network business and this and that. There isn't time to tell stories the way he would tell stories about ball players and situations and maybe his father, the railroad engineer, and all kinds of stuff. 
um, he had time to be Red Barber, and, and there is no time for that anymore. Of course, it's not just the stories you have, it's the way you tell them, too. Exactly right. And this was a man who's, as I said, his father was a railroad engineer, a very gregarious, outgoing man who was a great storyteller. His mother was an English teacher uh, who insisted on proper grammar from all of her children. Now, you put the two together, and you have Red Barber. You have a very literate, very literary, outgoing storyteller. Uh, it's just the perfect combination of people to make a Red Barber who was probably trained from an early age, subconsciously or not, to, to keep those synapses active. Because, you know, when you, your mind is a muscle, you exercise your mind, you don't, uh, you don't it, it doesn't go slack uh, as quickly as other parts of the body. Well, he worked in the very early days of radio. Uh, it was only 10 years old when uh, he got into it. It was 1930. And they were still making it up as they went along. Now, this, this taught you to think on your feet. Everything was an ad-lib situation, unless you were reading news copy, I suppose, or reading the, the sponsor's copy he had provided. Everything else was just seat-of-the-pants radio. So he was a pro at that. Now, today, I have, to, I have to tell you, I'm not one of those people. I need a script. I need to follow an outline. I need some kind of direction. Well, Red got me out of that a bit. Because these four minutes we had every week were just totally spontaneous. The only spontaneous bit on the program. And uh, I would have to think on my feet. I would have to be ready for the curveballs he would throw me. And he would. You know, he would delight in that. Said, Let's see how the young fellow's going to handle this one. <laughs> yeah. Well, it is a bit revealing to see how, how you changed, too, uh, through I the certainly years. Did. I certainly did. I matured as a broadcaster. I became a better broadcaster. I, I became a more confident broadcaster to the point today where I don't think anyone could intimidate me. I couldn't get Mike Fright, no matter who I was interviewing. because And Red Barber is you know, the one I have to thank for that. Even if they brought up Azaleas? I'm ready for azaleas, <laughs> thanks to Red, and camellias, and amaryllis, and caladiums, and all those things. Wisteria. <laughs> I didn't know anything about the garden. I probably still don't, but it, I know the ones Red and I talked about. Well, you know, a, a, again, to evidence the, the, uh, the emotion that people attach to the, these brief little conversations is the note that you referred to getting when, when he asked you what kind of tree you'd fallen on your house, and you said a green tree. People took you to task for oh, that. they did. They did. Why are you acting like a smart aleck with that nice red barber? He asked you a perfectly nice question. And then he wanted to know about my, the camellias I had in the backyard. And, and uh, he said, uh, what, are they, what, are, what kind do you have? And I said, pink. Well, this wouldn't do. I mean, they have names. You know, they have names like Julio Nuzio, which sounds like a second baseman to me. <laughs> but uh, he wanted to know what kind. Uh, I said, uh, you know, what was its name? He said, well, I don't know, Fred, Frank. I don't know. We're just getting to know each other. It just bloomed. That was unacceptable to Red. You know, to, to have a, a dozen years and uh, have him only miss three or four, uh, uh, less than uh, less than half a dozen uh, Fridays in all that mm -hmm. time. Well, when you've got Christmas Day falls on Sunday some years and Thanksgiving, well, you know, the holiday, people take off for the whole weekend and they're gone. People get sick. People go on vacation. That's an incredible endurance record. Well, he stayed close to home. He stayed close to Tallahassee. He didn't want to travel much. His wife was very ill, and he was kind of paying her back for all the years that he was on the road, and she was a baseball widow. Um, so he stayed pretty close to his house. And um, so it was, I don't think it was hard for I think he actually looked forward to those four minutes every Friday. It, it kept his hand in the business. Uh, I think he enjoyed telling his story to a new generation and, frankly, a new audience because uh, it must be said the NPR audience is not uh, a big sports audience. <laughs> <laughs> but it didn't matter to them. It didn't matter to them because of how special Red was. Couldn't help wondering how many, over the years, how many young people or not so young have said in their own way to their own parent, Daddy, who is Red Barber? Yeah. They did, and they found out. <laughs> um, yeah, Red reached a whole new group of people who had never heard him broadcast and, uh, you know, play by play, doing him an actual baseball game. So they'll have to go to the archive tapes for that, but they could hear him in another venue every Friday morning. It'd be kind of superfluous and almost pointless to try to say, what can we replace, replace Red with? I mean, yeah. you, you can't replace Red. We knew that day was going to come, obviously, and, and we knew all along that we would never try it uh, for two reasons. One, um, 
It just seemed sacrilegious. It's, it seemed irreverent to uh, say that we could replace Red Barber to even think about it. But the other thing was, how would you like to be the guy who followed him? It would be like following Bear Bryant at Alabama or you know, Tom Landry at Dallas. You just don't want to do that. Um, puts you in a very awkward position. The guy who follows Tommy Lasorda. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Some Dodger fans might <laughs> yes. suggest someone should. Bob Edwards, who is 76 now, left NPR in 2004. He currently hosts a podcast for the AARP. And you can get a copy of Fridays with Red by Bob Edwards by clicking on the link in our show notes or by going to our website, heardeverything.com. And that's where you'll hear my interviews with two other major figures in radio for National Radio Day, my 2003 conversation with Garrison Keeler. In Minnesota, you're not quite allowed to enjoy your success. We are a culture of modest people, and, and we, we would actually prefer that you come in second or third. And my 1995 interview with Wolfman Jack, which actually turned out to be his last radio interview. I remember when Elvis came out with his first record, Heartbreak Hotel. He was probably the only white artist on the whole program, and it was quite unusual to have a white artist doing rock and roll back in those days, you know. And of course, we post new episodes of Now I've Heard Everything every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. And you can find us on every major podcast platform. In fact, if there's a platform that you use that you can't find us on, let me know. Thank you so much for listening. Next time on Now I've Heard Everything, he made a big name for himself in the 60s with his expose of Chevy's Corvair and its dangers. Uh, his book was called Unsafe at Any Speed. Well, Ralph Nader has devoted his life and career to consumer activism. And finally, in 1993, he wrote a book about airline safety. So we'll revisit my 1993 interview with Ralph Nader. Why don't they tell you which airlines are safer? The pilots know which airlines are better in maintenance standards. There are differences in terms of aging aircraft. People should have scorecards available to them. That's next time on Now I've Heard Everything. I'm Bill Thompson.